uh, um, a moonlight scene um, um, with a group of, group of uh, um, uh, um, fakirs round a fire. And I had no idea, um, uh, various scholars had suggested that this was this building that we see on the banks of the, of the river was in Upper India, and I was never able to un identify it. And actually, it was published as a view in Upper India in the Zofany catalog. And then, quite by chance, I found a photograph um, when I was doing some research of Dhaka, of, of old Dhaka, and I found this building um, which still stands to this day, and it it's, stands in the um, old cemetery at Narinda, um, and it's called Columbo's Tomb. And it was the first indication we had that Zofany had actually visited the city. But it, it led me immediately to realize that the part of the painting was also by Zofany. This is uh, um, the gate uh, Lal Bagh, and the most interesting thing is um, this, this is the part of the previous painting. So, I'm sorry. Is that this figure is the figure that appears in the little sketch of the interior of the chess players that we saw two photographs earlier, the identical figure. Um, these, two, these two paintings um, were uh, um, both included in the um, Zofany exhibition. And uh, um, he was almost certainly invited to, the, to, to Dhaka by the, the Nawab, who himself was a formidable collector of paintings. So that brings me to the end of what I'm going to talk about this evening. Um, I hope I've shown you a few paintings um, that, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, that you, will, you will have never seen before, but I think Naman uh, 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 um, will be able to go into much greater depth um, than I have, about, particularly about the Polyar conversation piece. I'm just going to go back one painting to this painting because this has a very interesting connection with The Last Supper, which I, I, I'm sorry that I, I, I'm not going to be speaking about this evening. But in the very background of the Last Supper, there is a landscape, a moonlit landscape. And that moonlit landscape was copied from, it has exactly the same composition as this view of Dhaka. This is, this is, this is something that you find very often with Zofany. He used the same props and the same, the same, same figures and the same uh, 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 um, landscapes in different paintings and it's often a key to being able to identify uh, 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 um, his, his works. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here. It's uh, payback time, as it were, for me. I've been extraordinarily lucky that um, Jayanta Sengupta has lent me this picture in the first place to be able to show it in the exhibition India in the world. And I thought I should try and offer an explanation as to why it's in the exhibition at all. And how does it feature, and why should it feature in an exhibition called India and the, the World? The painting is a revealing self-portrait made by Zafani in a studio in Lucknow in the 1780s. Zafani has positioned himself with Claude Martin, Antoine Pollier, and John Wombwell in a rather reflective mood. You can't really see it, but you will. I'll try and give you close-ups. That quality of introspection that you see in Zofany's face is shared with several other works by Zofany and is a quality of his known from details of his life as well. In some ways, Zofany bears witness to the events around him and in so doing reveals an awareness of matters we now know as Orientalism. At the outset it must be said that my own views follow writers like William Presley and Ronald Paulson, outlandish though they may be to some, because they've been assiduously trying to find deep layers of meaning in Zofany's iconographies. Paulson noted once, there is something strange, 
rather perhaps deeply private about Zafani's paintings. The subject-object relationships of the picture, if we take it to be a picture about people looking at works of art, are put into question as an artifact equally real that returns the look of the spectator. An overcrowded canvas with equal emphasis upon objects and humans, signs of the artist himself as an odd distraction and a plainly public iconography that hints at a private meaning. These are the salient feature features, we are told, that characterize the best of Zoffany's paintings. Some other writers feel that the work of these scholars is too interpretative. These writers feel that Zoffany himself did not read quite as much as we may into his paintings. And I don't believe that to be true. But even if it were so, it does not diminish the contempt it does not diminish contemporary scholars' enriching readings of Zoffany's art. Besides the consistency with which Zoffany employs iconographic symbolism in his work, certainly builds up a pattern of visual devices, a syntax of symbolism, if you will, which brings a necessary consistency to the interpretations that are available on his work. There is more than just circumstantial evidence that points to Zoffany's engagements with religious and aesthetic philosophy, and his incorporation of them in his art is only to be expected. His paintings have to be contextualized within a wider framework of what we know of his personal life, the correspondences he maintained, and the people he surrounded himself with. Presley says, Throughout his career, Zoffany executed a large number of self-portraits, and it is within this group of images that one encounters the most revealing commentaries on his, of his ambitions, often with a disguised content underlying the ostensible subject. It is clear from these works that he saw himself within the ancient tradition of melancholy genius. Furthermore, he engaged in complex adaptations of this tradition, involving a personal and original use of conventional iconography. The sophistication of his adaptations was one means by which he concealed his purpose. If his intent had been readily accessible to all of us, such a superior stance would have alienated his most important patrons. And I think that's quite relevant. Zoffany manages to conceal a lot of what he wants to say because it wasn't going to be acceptable. So he cloaks it in a picture which is about something else, which is the ostensible subject. But the pictures are very often about much more than what the painting itself reveals. Amongst the self-portraits that make for the most valid comparisons with the one we know of from Lucknow include the one painted at the Uffizi. Um, this one, for instance, I think. The Tribune of, of the Uffizi is loaded with allegorical symbolism that underlies the publicly displayed that underlies publicly displayed artworks, each of which each of which have been curated and placed in the paintings by Zoffany to reveal a complex art historical narrative. Each of these pictures reveal a conflict between piety and the seductive, if ephemeral, lure of life. Zoffany famously used his royal connections to force the officials of the Uffizi to gather and collect whatever he wanted from the collection to decorate his studio. So he, he cherry-picked these pictures, and he staged them in this way. He curated it. These were artfully and carefully displayed, and various elites of Florentine society would have had, would have audience of this salon, and for a fee, were even painted into the picture through which Zoffany intended to immortalize them. Not only do these pictures in the picture therefore perform the role of building a dense narrative about the conflict between piety, lust, and the fragility of life, but the people captured therein also become part of that very narrative because they themselves are seeking immortality by being present in this very seductive interior. That he gave much thought to iconography as an assiduous student of art history is even more obvious with other pictures as well. 
Now this picture, for instance, shows 36 people of which 34 were members of the original Royal Academy. Zofni paints himself at the bottom left. Zofni was one of the founding members of the Royal Academy of London in 1768 upon nomination by King George III. And soon after he arrived in India in 1783, he also became a founding member of the Asiatic Society of Bengal under Sir William Jones. A founding member of these two organizations. That's quite interesting. I think that's one of our most important connects. Zafani therefore comes across as a man at the vanguard of those scholarly and cultural institutions that were deeply committed to defining the civilizational importance of the role of art, literature, and philosophy, both in Britain and in India. In this painting, for instance, I mean, we can see there is a whole heap of symbolism. I have, I have to confess, a 31-page um, text and I'm never going to be able to get through if I start going into the symbolism of each of these very loaded paintings. So please allow me to be brief, and if you have questions, we can try and go back to some of these pictures. Another picture, for instance, the wealthy aristocrat Charles Townley's formidable collection of antiquities, which remain today at the core of the British Museum now, including Discobulus, Discobulus, incidentally, marks the entrance to the exhibition of India and the world. It's the key figure, so I mean, it's interesting to see it in its setting with its collector. Um, inspired by the Uffizi portrait, Townley wanted himself in a picture surrounded by his art collection. Zoffany complied and made him one that was a little smaller than the Uffizi painting. Zoffany is not present in this picture, but Townley's conversation with three other humans is incidental to his engagement with sculpture. Antiquarianism was not just about collecting. It was to get in touch with what messages and energies the ancient sculptures provided. Zoffany originally went to India, as we've just heard, for financial reasons, and there were great opportunities to make money from, from potential clients and patrons who would, who would have commissions who would have commissioned portraits. In his own words, he hoped to roll in gold dust in India. While in India, he developed his skill in painting landscapes, a genre that had particular importance in the milieu in which he found himself. Colonial travelogues had just come into vogue at the time when Zafani painted his pictures here in India. And pictures of landscape we all know now, were known to fulfill both factual and symbolic purposes. Zofni, as we have heard, was German-born, spent six, nearly six years in India, mostly in Calcutta and Lucknow. A true cosmopolitan, he had trained in Rome, worked in Germany, etc. During his six-month-long voyage to India, Zofni earned a reputation as a portrait painter, and this resulted in a recommendation to Warren Hastings, who was then Governor General, on his arrival in India in 1783. Hastings recommended him to the court of, court of, Nawab, of the Nawab of Awadh, Asaf Uddola, and his Prime Minister, Hassan Raza Khan, whose patronage he won, and over the next two to three years, he painted some of his Indian masterpieces in Awadh, including this particular painting, we've just been told, one of his best works, Colonel Morden's Cockmatch. Now I offer you those just as a small context, a little background about this man and the kind of works he's already making. I'd like to now focus on the particular painting I want to talk about and its particular context. Let's think about the context. Johann Zoffany arrived in India during the Second Anglo-Mysore War, being fought between the British East India Company and the, Sultan and the Sultans of Mysore. The Regulating Act had just been passed, and it was just a few years before the permanent settlement of Bengal was to be effected by the East India Company. Warren Hastings was Governor General, wielding control over both Madras and Calcutta. Conflict between the Europeans and Indians over the control of India's land, trade, and wealth was all around him. And the Europeans pointing to the land, produce, and harbors of India in this picture is obviously an appropriate metaphor for what he was seeing around him. Hastings left Calcutta for Lucknow after he'd introduced Zafani to the Nawab of Awadh. In the late 18th century, the journey between these two places marked, as we've just heard, 
a transition between two distinctly different worlds, as you said. Calcutta, despite a very large population, revolved around a European presence. And life for most of the Europeans there mirrored life back in London with its rigid social structure and mores, and above all, a narrowness of outlook, I think you've said. Lucknow relieved Zafani of this Eurocentric formality and inspired a creativity to produce some of his best works. Now this is a painting about painting. And it is called a conversation piece because it is an informal group portrait in which the artist has shown himself, it's a self-portrait, at the center of the picture, turning around to look at us and bearing witness to the events that he is narrating. Zafani is in the act of painting and all around him are paintings on parade, the type of pictures that had become formulaic productions of the grand project of enlightenment to gather knowledge from all corners of the world. Tropical landscapes, verdant fields, vistas anew are populated with simpleton natives, including their abominable practices like sati, supplying the very information the English and French adventurers that sit next to him need. Knowledge gathering that would lead inexorably to power and colonial control. Zofany is seated here in a studio in the winter, wearing a gray coat, at work on a canvas while surrounded by Indian informants, surveyors and servants, and Colonel Antoine Paulier, Claude Martin, and John Wormwell. The East India Company administrator or assay master, John Wormwell, was an accountant, was the company's paymaster at the Calcutta Mint which was responsible for the earliest, the Calcutta Mint, as you know, was responsible for the earliest discovery of Indian scripts, languages, and symbolism. So there was a scholarly concern. Antoine Paulier, from a Huguenot family, was a Swiss engineer and antiquarian who amassed a large collection of Sanskrit and Persian manuscripts and died in France following the revolution. Claude Martin, was initially in the French army and fought against the English in the Carnatic Wars and then later became major general in the British army, was formidably wealthy, utterly self-made, and he was instrumental in creating a hybrid style of art and architecture that mixed European and Indian sensibilities that had a lasting impact. And of course, Claude Martin's most lasting legacy was to be the La Martinere schools that are named after him. Now I shall return to a brief biography of these gentlemen briefly. We don't know exactly where this work was painted or for whom. Zofany was a shrewd painter, as again we've just heard, who learned to protect his interests in the face of capricious aristocratic and royal patrons who were apt to shirk pay paying their dues. We know that while painters like Ozias Humphrey never received a penny for the money that they were owed from the works by the Nawabs, Zofany had been clever enough to get the British resident to endorse his account against the Nawab and guarantee payment. Although there is no evidence for it, Mildred Archer has suggested that Zofany may have painted this picture in 1787 as a leaving gift for Pollier. She suspects that the painting Martin is pointing at is probably Martin's own work, for he is holding paintbrushes in his right hand and is drawing John Wormwell's attention to the sketch. So there's Martin pointing to a picture and he's got brushes in his hand. Some other writers, however, feel that this work could have been in the collection of Claude Martin, given what a major collector Martin was and because he was known to have owned a number of Zoffany's works. It's just that <clears throat> Neither of those are completely convincing. Why? Because in the center of this painting, Zofany, Zofany himself is the fulcrum of this picture, which is a bit insouciant if you're going to paint a painting for somebody else, to make yourself the centerpiece of a painting. His friend's energies tear out of the frame, distracted by material matters, food, a house, while his own concerns are more elevated. He's a painter. And, <laughs> and that too, he is looking at this eternal banyan with the Hindu ascetic at the center of it all. 
If his other self-portrait saw a more modest inclusion in the periphery, zophony, in the corner of one picture and the bottom of another, and so on, here he is, the subject of the picture. So putting himself and his own activities at the core shows rather more daring than any other previous work. It would have been a very indulgent friend who would have asked Zoffany for a painting about Zoffany. A friend who was more interested in Zoffany, perhaps, than himself. And so was it Polier or Martin who loved and admired him so? Given its complex subject matter of how the artist's eyes bear witness to the political, economic, military, and educational developments in India, it may have been perhaps a portrait commissioned for an institution, such as the Asiatic Society in Calcutta or London, or was it a picture that he painted for himself? We've just heard that certainly he was financially far more secure by this point in his life, and it wouldn't be beyond the pale to think of him making a work that was not about somebody else. Certainly the provenance history of this painting needs some research and more discussion. Zoffany, as we've been told, was certainly an extraordinary man. An adventurer, an entrepreneur, would be putting it mildly. The opening page of the Royal Academy's 2011-2012 reassessment of Zoffany says that he was notorious for his interest in beautiful young women, but some writers have claimed that he was homosexual and somebody else has even claimed that he was a cannibal. Obsessive about artistic symbolism and the